Welcome to the Onyx Pathcast. I'm this week's host, Eddie Webb, <laughs> and we are at Onyx PathCon. It's so Hooray. weird to hear you say that when I can see you. I know, right? Like... <laughs> I've never seen either of you before. This is a revelation. <laughs> Who are you people? Why are you in my stream? How did I know, I mean, I'm not... then? Well, I'm not looking at the screen. I'm looking at my camera, and somehow I can see the both of you. It's, <laughs> it's bizarre. Uh, what are you doing in there? What, how, how are you getting so small? <laughs> It's a, a secret it, it's a time zone thing. Ah, that again. Yeah, the you're time in, zones. You're in the large time zone. We're in the compressed time zone right now. Right. Yeah, some kind of flux, some kind of some kind of trinity mechanic. We'll, <laughs> we'll, bl we'll blame quantum. <laughs> yeah, you get to put quantum in front of everything. Can't yeah, do. The, yeah. <laughs> the the villainous group from uh, the first two of the Daniel Craig Bond films, I guess. Was were they called Quantum in Casino Royale? Yes. Wait, oh, I don't know if it was, well, was that a retroactive thing? Through they were wonderfully titled Quantum of Solace. I I think it was retroactive because if I'm remembering correctly, they initially wanted it to be Smirsh, and then there was some copyright issues around that. I know that they couldn't be Spectre because oh, they were there was a the the guy who owned the Spectre license was the person who made Never Say Never Again, the unofficial Bond film. Uh -huh. uh, they couldn't use the word Spectre after. Uh, you only live twice, I think, mm -hmm. and so that's why they unceremoniously dumped Blofeld down a <laughs> chimney stack in For Your Eyes Only. It was their way of saying, we don't need Spectre, uh, and they never name him, they never name his group, they just drop him down a chimney in the opening crawl. But anyway, anyway, nice. this is, I've nice. missed this, I've missed talk, um, because you know something, you two... What? We haven't actually had a proper Onyx Pathcast where it's just us three shooting the shit <laughs> yeah for i don't know how long <laughs> i mean i did bring my switch so if you want to play mario kart I'm yeah mario kart. that that would be fun <laughs> I, unfortunately my son is playing on my switch I, it's no longer my switch <laughs> <laughs> or for, for folks who may not be aware of how this works um uh the onyx pathcast is a podcast that we've been doing for almost four years now uh, and it it's, does involve Onyx Path stuff usually, TM. It's actually, I think, over, is it over four years? It's 211 episodes. It's yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. My episodes. goodness. It was 2018 when we started, so uh, around there. Yeah. Oh, so two, four and a half years. Um, but uh, so this is it's a Q&A. We're going to have questions. We'll answer whatever questions sound interesting to us. Um, understand wow. some Wait, tell some, some people that, 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 that they're not interesting, Eddie. Well, it's I been mean, a long weekend. It, 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 we've answered a lot of questions. Um, and there may be some questions where like, we've, it may be like more like, hey, that question's been answered in the previous panel. We'll direct you that way rather than repeating that question here is more what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but also, we're going to ramble a lot because that, that's our brand, is, is we're going to go off topic, as, like, as you've seen immediately. Um, to the point where I don't think we actually have a topic. We so. also haven't introduced me or Matthew, but that's okay. Well, because you all started talking, so... I did. Uh, who is going to tune into their very first Onyx Path stream with it? Well, let, let's assume there are people. Dixie, who are you? I'm Dixie. <laughs> and Eddie? I'm Eddie. And my name is Matthew Dawkins. Thank you very much for watching the Onyx Good, Path Bye. cast. Many worlds. We're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, we are we are the three uh, in-house developers who now also have other titles at Onyx Pass. Uh, we started to do a podcast, as Eddie said. Ed Eddie, are you eating on the recording? Yes. Eddie, <laughs> it has been four years. Have you? I know. I, that, that, my, my standards have slipped so completely. Now. Wow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are the in-house developers. We all oversee different things, um, but we all are direct peers at work. So this is kind of our fun talk about projects and sometimes talk about random bullshit like uh deadly invasion the killer mm, movie. Yes. yeah so that that's a memory right i i vaguely recall that movie that was uh, recently i know i know i still uh, only vaguely recall it i mean there were okay. people in a house and well here, the here's the killer question if if let's say there were no more panels no more games today you had a free two to three hour slot Mm -hmm. and you were expected to either watch the third Hobbit movie or Deadly Invasion, Ooh. or 
what that spy movie <laughs> probably the I name. Mean, we can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. That, Secret that's Agent of, Lady Chaplin? That's yes. Secret Secret Agent Lady, Lady Chaplin. Chaplin. <laughs> or um the Trials of Hercules. It was one of Hercules' many trials. Um which one would you go for on a repeat viewing? Lady Eddie. Chaplin. Oh, Lady honestly, Chaplin. Oh, Dixie Chaplin, yeah. straight in with the Lady Chaplin. Honestly, Lady Chaplin, yeah. I mean, that was actually that's... a decent movie of the film. It was. I wouldn't call it decent, but it was not It was bad. way better than most of the other ones. Yeah, the... I mean, critically speaking, I think the Hercules movie had some Italian issues. Sorry, Michele, if you're watching. I'm sure you're the only Italian who... <laughs> <laughs> who tunes in? Um, I literally just commented there. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, it had the usual overdubbing problem, overacting, but it did have Christopher Lee in a very small part. Uh, not enough to save the film. I think Lady Chaplin was the most consistently entertaining. Yes. Um, obviously, The Hobbit 3 had the greatest production value but bloat does not make up for a lack of story or meaning <laughs> I, I was playing DD recently and i took inspiration from the third hobbit movie where i was playing my goliath and my friend was playing a tiny little character who was also a druid and i was like what if i throw you and while i'm throwing you you turn into a bear yes and yes she was like, yes and so we did that and it was great the only the redeeming film I was about to say, yeah, yeah, definitely. That and the uh, dwarf who was shuffling to himself in a, in a corner at one point, looking at the wall like the guy at the end of Blair Witch, which could have been, he was about to be murdered, but could have been something a lot more lewd. In fact, it was something very bland, which kind of sums up the entire movie. Could have been interesting, could have been sexy, but instead it was nothing. It was right. grey. Well, what is the most boring option? We'll take that one, Hobbit 3. Yeah, yeah. Anyway... Why are we here? Why are we here? Well, I assume we're talking a little bit about what we've done so far this convention. Yes! Indeed. Um, so, well, we'll start with uh, Dixie. Um, uh, what have you been doing this convention? I'm mostly trying not to show my COVID symptoms on air. Uh, <laughs> Good job. Good job with that. <laughs> because I have had COVID since Thursday. Um, I've gone through most of a bottle of Dayquil. But, you know, do what you gotta do. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I've done a lot of panels. Uh, I've been doing, I'm on 10 panels this weekend total, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm running tech for two more. So I have a bunch of obligations that luckily let me sit at my computer very comfortably. Um, but yeah, we did the opening ceremonies. That was super fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been talking about Exalted. I ran the tech for Scion. I was talking to the Donna group yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, doing all just all kinds of fun stuff over the weekend. Uh, I talked about Pugmire. I uh, sat in on the Trinity panel for a little while. I wasn't on it, but I sat, sat there yelling about Anima. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, overall having a really good time. And, and to be fair, she, that was very accurate. Dixie was just posting Anima in all caps like two or three times. Well, so. because he <laughs> mentioned Anima, and I was like, Anima! <laughs> it's so good! Uh, I, I was resisting doing things like What's your favorite part of Anima, Eddie, and why is it the chapter I wrote? Because uh, <laughs> obviously you, you want to do that, but it's it's, it's very self-serving. Uh, right. I didn't get to see the whole They Came From panel, so I'm going to have to watch that on BOD. Oh, um, you missed a treat. Well, I can still watch it. Well, no. since, since Matthew's here, maybe he can tell us his experiences with the convention. It's been minimal, honestly. For some reason, <laughs> I didn't get books. <laughs> Yes, yes. He, you, you snubbed our What's Up panel. I didn't. I was snubbed by the panel, as it has turned out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, shock revelation. It's like the end of the JFK movie. Um, well, let's hope I don't end up the same way. Uh, the <laughs> Back into the left. Back into the left. Yes. Um, what, what have I done? <laughs> What have I done? <laughs> they the, they came from panel. Uh, yes, I was on that. What did we do? We discussed the various they came from games and we did a lot of teasers and uh, discussion of what's to come and they came from the Danger Zone, our mm -hmm. 1980s action movie they came from. Uh, that is going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely ridiculous. And uh, that that's kind of the point that they came from. But we also spoke about how they came from is a fantastic game for well, newcomers and established role players alike. Uh, we spoke about how to use comedy. We spoke about how to make games 
Hollywood cinematic. Uh, we covered things like our favorite aspects of each they came from. We all selected a favorite child from the array of they came from. And we, I think, worked out that there's something like 36 playable archetypes across all of the they came from so far. Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, which, given that the games are completely crossover compatible, means you can play Beneath the Sea with 36 playable archetypes. Um, wow. So you which should isn't... run Beneath the Sea with 36 player characters. Just right Yeah, up. Uh, doable. I mean, Centipus is probably going to eat 20 of them at the very beginning. That's how right. I would start that one. Right. Uh, and then make the rest of Battle Royale. Uh, but, <laughs> when, but, when, but when I... Uh, when I say there's something like 36 archetypes, what that actually breaks down to is each archetype has something like 10 tropes. Mm -hmm. So that's something like 360 tropes that are still interchangeable between archetypes. Mm -hmm. uh, each one's got something like 25 quips. And so when you start magnifying using scale, scale's a very good mechanic oh God, no, that's good. Uh, to, to study these things, it turns out they came from as a very expansive line. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, uh, we discovered this during the course of the panel. I had some wonderful questions. Uh, also, I ran they came from Camp Murder Lake uh, yesterday. How was that? A lot of fun. Uh, it, uh, sadly, one character died at almost the halfway point, uh, had a bottle jammed down his gullet. So he was swigging some hooch and then BAM! Uh, serial killer uh, puts an end to him. Uh, we had another person that was knifed to death by a spectral child um so that one didn't make it but it was also my very first they came from camp murder lake game that involved a scene of oral sex what <laughs> um not not played explicitly we did it very delicately very sensitively so no one in the audience might be offended didn't or indeed that. among the players no i, <laughs> yeah. I I've gotta say i didn't as the npc on the receiving <laughs> end uh nevertheless <laughs> nevertheless these things happen in 1980s slasher movies. I mean, that's not uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, and as this one was set in an amusement park with a tunnel of love, something had to happen. And and Fair. it did. It did. Uh, so, yes, uh, it was the funk... Was it what, the funk tunnel of love or something like that? They were in funk land, it was, which was, it was a It was the funk, funk house. I saw the, I saw the, the drawing. Mm. Well, yes, the name of the scenario was the funk house of horror. Nowhere mm -hmm. to run in brackets. Couldn't get the license to actually use the song. And uh, yeah, the, there were various funk themed rides uh, throughout the amusement park. There was the unofficial James Brown Museum. Uh, the <laughs> there was the Helter Bow Bow Skelter. Uh, yeah, there was all kinds of uh, wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, oh, Papa's got a new, ba brand new bag, which was like the shopping district. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, it was a lot of fun. Uh, all of these things are available either here on the Occultists Anonymous channel, uh, on the various channels we've got running uh, games, Plastic Age Plays, among others. We will be transferring these over to our YouTube channel over the coming weeks. So don't feel you've missed out if you missed it. That's funny. You missed it, but you can still watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie, have you run any games? Um, I did. Uh, I ran a uh, Squeaks in the Deep game. Um, it, I, it was interesting uh, because I had a two-hour slot. and uh, That's a short game. Yeah. I mean, so behind the scenes, basically, we were giving kind of just here's some slots. And I was like, oh, there's a two-hour one. I'd like to try that because I have run like 15-minute and one-hour demos. Right. And I have run three or four-hour games. And they were actually to run a two-hour game. Right. Mm. And I was interested to see if I could pace a really short, kind of like a short story. It's like a full adventure, but it's it's a short moment. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out I can't. Um, <laughs> I, as we got to two hours, it's like, and you fight the guy, and there's a bunch of stuff in the bottom pocket, but I gotta go by. I mean, it was kind of crushed at the end, honestly. But uh, we did get to show off some of the um, upcoming content for this Quick Steep Companion. Uh, uh, they, they ran into the um, underground village of Azure Sky, which is a uh, village of hares and rabbits with a dark secret. Turns out the dark secret is actually a, a, a were creature of some kind called a wolf tinger. Um, and uh, I actually ran it with uh, Monarchies of Mao as a base because something I don't know we've talked a lot about is both pirates and uh, Squeaks in the Deep are actually meant to be universal supplements. They work for either Pirate for Pugmire or Monarchy's Mound. Mm -hmm. But Pirates of Pugmire tends to work a little better with Pugmire, I've noticed, because um, the, the 
water dog the port there's just more kind of resonance with with the pugmire setting and i feel like squeaks and deep works better with uh monarchies of mal because you know the traditional clash between cats and mice and then the kind of politics of of both sides i think resonate really really well so i actually used uh one of mouse starting characters as opposed to pugmire characters and it did actually add an interesting kind of frisson to the whole scenario so cool it was really fun and then we had the pugmire panel um where uh we talked a lot more about squeaks and deep and which uh, dixie was on as well as travis and that was a lot of fun as we talked about um how that kind of evolved and where the where pugmire is going in the future and you know we don't have anything announced yet but there are definitely projects more projects coming how much i love pugmire yes and and, and that was really really awesome uh, and I do have an update from the chat. Um, apparently, uh, the chat is starting to pick sides on to whether we stubbed Matthew or Matthew stubbed us. So that's that's great to see. Awesome, awesome. Good job. <laughs> I think the truth is clear. I mean, it's a numerical advantage on their side. How could I snub all three of them? I, I have the utmost faith that you would be able to do so. I mean, I think if we really dig deep, we can just blame Travis who made the overlays. Yeah, uh, that's fair. That's fair. Well, yeah, I had nowhere to appear. It's either or I had to share a frame with one of you, and let's be honest, the size of our heads, we're not going to manage that. Right, right. I do have an uh, abnormally large head. Well, uh, that, that exactly my point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Zach rules in chat just pointed out um, that Travis and Chaz had a panel on Friday night. They said a two-hour slot. Uh, you have to start out by getting right into the action, shoot a character in the first five minutes to get things started with a bang. Ha <laughs> ha, bang. Um, and that's a good point. It's, it's something I hadn't thought of. Uh, it's kind of I, I had a little kind of easing into the scenario, and maybe I probably should have just gone right to, okay, and weird things happen, and now you're in the village, you can go. Yeah. So that's something I mm -hmm. learned, and I'm, I'm moving ahead on. Zach also pointed out that Matthew's in the chat, and I know, because he relegated him there. Right. He was banished. See? See, you chat. relegated me there. Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 Confession. Up. Well, I didn't want to use passive voice and say that he was relegated there. Oh, okay. I forgive you. That's, that's, that's I was trying funny. to use active voice. Yes. <laughs> Re Reginald Putty would be on you if you started using passive voice. I, I love that Dixie will always incriminate herself to make sure that passive voice is removed. So that's I, true dedication. I listened to one of my true crime pod. It's a total tangent. I don't care. What? Uh, I listened to a true crime <laughs> podcast that I, I really love called Case File because they handle things very sensitively. They're very like facts only, no editorializing mm. kind of stuff, right? They don't occasionally break to, break to ads for Blue Chew and uh, Omaha <laughs> State. They do occasionally break for ads because that's how podcasts work. Yes. But past <laughs> that, they are overall very, very good and serious. But the one thing I hate is that whoever writes their copy just only uses passive voice. Oh. And so I'm constantly like, can no, you not? Bad. Can you? Can you like? Water bottle. Please, please stop. Please stop. <laughs> she, she was killed by a mystery man. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Only Australian. Yeah, she was Australian. killed by an, <laughs> by by a mystery man. Uh, I don't know what the hell happened. I used to be able to do a good Australian accent. Hang on. Struth or Lou. She was killed by a mystery man, mate. You <laughs> sounds like Neil trying to sound like you. Yeah, <laughs> what kind of cursed inception is this? <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, we, we, we've digressed a lot, but um, a lot of people have been, in, in chat have been asking. We have been teasing that there's something that we wanted to announce here on this podcast thing. Yes, what? yes. I forgot so, completely. <laughs> uh, so, Matthew, <laughs> since I don't know what it is, and Dixie doesn't know what it is, I assume I know you what do. it is. I just don't know how to describe it. Well, I mean, because if no one knows what it is, then we, it's going to be really I know what it's called. Mm. Well, Ooh. how about you tell us what it's called, and then Matthew can help give us more information. No, no. Matthew, uh, wants to tell I, what it's called? Yes, it okay. is called uh, Super Suki <laughs> Kitchen Nightmare tw 12 in Roman numerals Dragon Tensai. It's a game I've been working on for a very long time. Kitchen based. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> what about every time the title changes except for the words Dragon Tensai? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only ones I remember. <laughs> but I like the idea of the main character being called Super Suki. I think that Super actually Suki. really it is works. Good. I like that. Um, as our restaurateur. But no, no. Uh, and she has a dragon in the back, and it's really difficult to manage the restaurant <laughs> at the front where you've got a dragon working the kitchen. But I that isn't the that. If it's a barbecue <laughs> restaurant, the dragon could like be in charge of the, of the meat. <laughs> It's the short order cook. 
Can a dragon moderate the heat of its flame? I don't see why not. That's where the dice rolling comes in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> what, that, that, that's the main role of the game. No. Uh, so the actual game, I, I don't think there's... So I'm going to be a bit teasery. I'm not going to yeah. be going into all the details. And part of that is because we're in first drafts. There's things that still need to fall into place. And I don't want to say anything that may be subject to change. Uh, but I can give you all the general concept mm -hmm. uh, i'm not very good at elevator pitches as rich thomas would tell you when i first pitched uh, i think they came from to him we it's were we elevator. were in a lift and then we were stood outside the lift for another 10 minutes <laughs> i mean i think yesterday we, we were talking about elevator pitches and i said you're just getting there like leaning on the like closed door button <laughs> <laughs> bing, bing, bing. just a <laughs> Uh, but so, oh. our, this is a story path game. It's a brand new IP. And it's a story path fantasy game. It's a fantasy game that undoubtedly has a very strong dungeon crawl element, but it also has an interestingly subversive political element. Uh, now, those may sound like very broad topics. If you are familiar with the Pathcast where we discussed games like mm -hmm. Super Suki, uh, Silver Kitchen, Dragon Ball X, and so on, uh, Tensai, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Tensai under, damn it. <laughs> you may recall one of the games that we came up with uh, when we were just brainstorming was called The World Below. Mm hmm and this, after coming up with it in the spur of the moment, set the gears whirring in my head mm -hmm. for, well, could this actually become a game? Could, is this workable uh, beyond concept level? And so I started tinkering away with it and ultimately came up with a pitch that uh, both Rich and I liked to the mm. degree that we've decided to take it further. And the general concept of the world below is that you are all subterranean beings, uh, mm. but not necessarily by nature. Something occurred on the world above, something cataclysmic, that drove you in an exodus, refugees, to the subterranean world. And the closer to the surface you are, the harsher your life. Whatever's contaminated, infected, made the world above so toxic, is seeping through the ground. Uh, the lower down you get, for some reason, the cleaner the water, the cleaner the air, the mm. source of power uh, that is uh, basically fueling all of life managing to subsist in this world. Now, that creates a hierarchy of power imbalance, of course, where that's divided between different strata. Mm -hmm. uh, it has some traditional fantasy elements. You will still recognize certain peoples from fantasy, uh, uh, but you will have different roles, different classes, different archetypes uh, that are specifically suited to this game. Now, there are, of course, natural and unnatural ha inhabitants of this world, as well as uh, every kind of horror from carnivorous bugs working as swarms to cosmic horrors existing in a place called the Fade, just on the edge of uh, one of these, one of the sides of this world. And it's a game that emphasizes exploration, community, building settlements, and survival. Undoubtedly, there's some, if you like Dystopia Rising, I think you'll find something to like. If you like Dungeon Crawls, you'll find something mm. to like. It's not all about hacking through the earth and making tunnels. It's also about hacking through the earth and discovering fully intact, but somehow preserved and entombed dungeons that have been laid down here by people long before. I won't go much further than that because I've said a lot, but this is it at a concept level. There's a hell of a mm -hmm. lot that we're exploring with it. We've got a fantastic team on it who have been beavering away. And uh, yeah, it's something I am greatly looking forward to exploring with Story Path. Um, I guess most importantly, it isn't a they came from game. Uh, so this isn't a haha, isn't fantasy silly. This is a fantasy game of the D, D Pathfinder mold uh, with elements of Pendragon uh, through the sense of community building and generational mm -hmm. play uh, and lots of other things besides. So hopefully 
you like the sound of what I'm talking about, because we'll be able to talk about it more as the game goes through development. Uh, I, I think it's the most excited I have been for a project in quite some time. That's not to diminish the other projects I've worked on, but getting to work on a brand new IP, uh, using rules in different ways, exploring a new world, creating a new world with the team, uh, and its many, many inhabitants is very, very exciting indeed. So keep your eyes open. I will be doing a strain of open development for this, which we were discussing on one of the previous panels. Mm -hmm. uh, Eddie, I think, mentioned it on the um, What's Up With Onyx path last night about mm -hmm. how we've sometimes gone back and forth from open development to manuscript previews. We'll be doing some open development here, so you get to see things well in advance of any kind of crowdfunding or however we decide to launch it. Mm. Um, and yeah, we will hopefully be playing around with the virtual tabletop space too uh, in a upfront manner, but we will see. We'll see what works and uh, keep you updated as the project moves along. I want to play. I, know, I want to play. I, I know we're not taking questions, but there is one question from the chat that I do need to relay from Alan Gilsped. I mean, we are taking questions, just not right now. Well, right, on, on this like thing. It's, it's literally called the podcast Q&A. Okay, let me phrase that. We're not taking questions on, necessarily on the world below because sure. we're going to talk so much. Yeah, okay. um, but uh, Alan Gilsped is asking uh, if beavers will be a playable race. And I'm bringing this up because finally it's not just me that gets these questions. <laughs> Tell you what, Alan, if you want to play a beaver, you go right ahead. And I'll just send <laughs> some swarms of carnivorous bugs your way. <laughs> um, there are caverns in this world that are made of the hollowed out husks of bugs, large ones, gigantic ones. But we can extend that to the hollowed out husk of a beaver. So, <laughs> so we can make this happen to you, Alan. I mean, we did have, there was a Pugmire story where a bunch of rats did animate the corpse of a badger. So I think we're in the same. Yeah, yeah, right. see? Exactly. Revenge. Yes, thank you. Real creepy. <laughs> Zombie beavers. Um, yes. But no, I, I'm with Dixie. It, it does sound really exciting. And uh, it's it's an interesting testament. Like we did the, let's come up with a brain or a game design idea a thing. Brain. Mainly because we wanted, it was a way to kill time, frankly. But also <laughs> we wanted to show, hey, ideas are easy, right? Because I know it's one thing we always constantly get is like, I have an idea for a game. How do I make it? And it's like, the ideas are, are the easy part. And yeah. so mm. we made a whole bunch of them. I have lots of ideas for games that I don't know if I'll ever make because who, who knows if they'll actually fly, you know? Right, yeah. exactly. But there was definitely, like, there was something in that one that attracted uh, Matthew's interest. And then he had fleshed it out to a point that something attracted Rich's interest. So, I mean, this fun little thing we did to to have an entertaining hour of podcasting turned into something yeah uh, and that's shows you that you know making a game is ultimately you come up with an idea then you spend the work to actually turn it into something that that could work mm -hmm. and then either you know talking to a publisher about doing it or doing it on your own which is very easy to do these days frankly yeah, uh, I mean, Cyclops's Cave, for they came from, was a great example to us of how fantasy can work in Story Path. Uh, and although they came from, is primarily seen as a comedy game or entertain light entertainment game, if you like. Uh, the mechanics in Cyclops's Cave are perfectly sound for games of a more serious nature. Now, that's not to say it's going to emulate Cyclops's Cave, but what it did was cement in my mind the okay, fantasy and story path really work well together. You know, mm -hmm. there maybe need to be some tweaks, mm -hmm. but I think that's natural for any game. Uh, oh, sure. There are very few universal systems out there that do genuinely apply perfectly both in not only mechanics but tone mm -hmm. to the games they are supporting. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, they came from the Cyclops' Cave as definitely an inspiration at a, at a mechanical level for this one. Indeed. And, I mean, you talk about um, uh, tweaks to the story path, and, and one thing that we've always been very open about is the fact that uh, a story path is meant to be flexible, mm -hmm. but um, we don't want decisions made for past games to necessarily gate how the system evolves for future games. Hmm. So that's why Scion and Trinity has some changes. They came from some changes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, but also, 
uh, uh, like we mentioned at uh, the What's Up panel, we've also learned a lot in the past five years of what yeah. path can do, what it does well, what we thought would work well that hasn't worked as much as we thought. Um, and so something like this is also a good chance for us to really hone in, okay, how do we emphasize what's working well in the system and how do we uh, quietly you know, detach or, or uh, uh, minimize things that turns out it wasn't the way it worked out the way we hoped it would. So mm -hmm. um, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, because really, I mean, if you think about it, Scion and Trinity were developed simultaneously. Yes. Uh, they came from, was developed, well, actually they came from in just Rising, both were developed from the Trinity manuscript, which is not done yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our story path games were developed in extremely short succession. This is the first one that can look back at several years of data and go, oh, okay, mm -hmm. what can we actually do to improve this? Yeah, no, and that's, that's a helpful thing. You know, every iteration changes, improves upon, steals from the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's why we're getting more refined versions, which is, I mean, that's, that's how additions work in most games. Right. We just happen to have a bunch of games that use the same system. So it's, it's like, it's like mini editions of the same system have been coming out. So like, yeah, story path 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.4, <laughs> you know, like. Right. Um, and and, and that, so to the point where like editions, fun. not really a meaningful distinction. It's something no. that we've inherited as a, as an industry. Yeah. But the reality is it's much more like, like how fate does something. It's like there, there's, there's fate accelerated. There's yeah. fate core. There's uh, a fate compact. There's also a new like fate compact. Yeah. Yeah. I just right. saw that the other day. Um, and so they all exist simultaneously. They all work just fine. It, but, you know, obviously they've learned how fate can be refined over the years. Yeah. So yeah. flavors of fate. I mean, I think um, the They Came Froms, as an example, have, and I may be incorrect, but I feel like every one of the core books has got successively shorter, just, just by degrees, you know, yeah. smaller. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we're cutting out, uh, we're wanting to, you know, deprive the customers of anything. It's just because as we grow more and more familiar with the system we've created, refinement results mm -hmm. in unnecessary bits being chopped away. And, you know, there's parts of they came from that are, I guess, core to story path and in a way yeah. core to they came from that I can still look at now and think, yeah, I'd rather do without them. I'm not going to do without them because some people are playing with them and some people enjoy them. But as a game designer, I look at them and think, were I to tackle they came from again in mm -hmm. five years or so, I know exactly the bits I would keep. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. certain of the bits that I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And that's not uh, me saying these are bad mechanics for story path. They are very good mechanics for some story path games. Right. They are just not as useful for they came from. Right. Like the paths, for example, um, in other story path games, the, the fact that there's three different paths and, and the idea is that the, the, the emphasis you put on each of those paths depends on the player and how you play it. And there's much more kind of even distribution. So these three components build the character you are, whereas mm. with they came from archetype is meant to be much heavier. It is much more, okay, the archetype drives everything else. Yeah. Um, and it's much more, I, I, I grab this, I plunk it down. I make a couple of other yeah. decisions, which have the other paths, but at the end of the day, I am the I am the the Joker. I am the Mad Scientist. Mm -hmm. I am all of these things, because that's what specifically that game does well. So it still mm -hmm. uses the paths and it uses it well, but that's not to say the other paths are meaningless. Rather, that just the emphasis has changed. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I, uh, I'm going to uh, call out one of our uh, colleagues right now um, <laughs> because Ian has posted in the chat. A cult of beavers who worship the unseen. We call it the cults of the of the damned, spelled with two M's. Yeah, because they make um, Which damned. is a pun that works great in audio, let me tell you. But um, I, I, I have now fired her, <laughs> and so which, wishing him well in his future endeavors. No, I'm mad. I'm mad now. I'm <laughs> yeah. Mad yeah, uh, clearly should have hired Ian for they came from, Mr. Tripper. <laughs> really, I'm surprised you haven't, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, I, you know what our rivalry is like. If we work together for oh, a long time, oh, that's why I forgot about the rivalry on on a game. They will come to blows. Someone will bleed uh, by red lines, if not Ian, final drafts. You did not just say rusty in peace. You did not just say that. And then, of course, uh, I'm okay that goes, oh, damn, with two M's. Right. Like, oh. 
Yeah. Um, and so Ian's gone too far now with rest in peace. Now you're getting too punny for they came from. There's a there's a line. There is Ian. a line. You, a yeah, line? you have disqualified yourself. I I will like writing for they came from is so much fun. I mm. I did they came from beyond the grave. I, I wrote a bunch of the monsters and like when I went back to look at my red lines, I was laughing at things I had written that I had mm. forgotten about. <laughs> and that's a good sign, right? If you like yes. write something. You, you wrote a scenario in this one. I did. Yeah. But, mm. if, but if you write something and you don't look at it for a minute and you come back to it and it makes you laugh, you're like, oh, okay. Good job, me, I guess. Yeah. Like, I at least hit my sense of humor. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll see if other people think it's funny. Uh, but I, I, I think they do. So that's, well, that's uh, exciting. I get that with Classified more than oh, yeah. any other they came from. The, because... So I've mentioned on a lot of panels, interviews, and so on, that the hardest thing to do as a developer on They Came From is find the tone and apply it consistently throughout all drafts. There's mm. some books that I've developed, like for Vampire, where tone isn't necessarily an issue. It's more like you're trying to get mechanical continuity or mm. metaphor continuity. Mm. And They Came From, it's more... There will always be a fairly thorough development pass on They Came From, specifically for the reason of tone. Mm -hmm. And with Classified, I was going through every single chapter, essentially adding in these little bits of, now listen here, agent, so, you know, sit your ass down right. and get yourself a cup of tea, because I've got a debriefing that will knock your pants off, that sort of thing. And uh, I was writing these, as, and as I was doing, I was, ha, 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 oh, this is good fun, uh, laughing <laughs> to myself because I'm a maniac. And... <laughs> Uh, the thing is, by the time I was done and I was adding some example text as well, I think it's the stunts in Classified. I think it's the stunts uh, where I added some example text of the unhappy missions of Agent Locke. <laughs> and um, yes. and they basically, there's a continuity to them as there is in, mm -hmm. in many of our games example text where if you mm -hmm. go from one to the next, you will see a story forming or it will make sense by the end. And I got to the end of this and thought, this is the best thing I've ever written. <laughs> the, the, this poor agent who is being treated like crap by absolutely everyone who is clearly useless at his job. I think he's amnesiac. He's lost his partner on a job. Mm. He uh, He's being targeted by a hitman, all for the reason of giving examples. <laughs> 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 and... Um, and I remember sharing this text with some people and kind of thinking, huh? Huh? Isn't this mm. funny? It just, yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't care because I can just read it and, and amuse myself, laugh yeah. into the night. And that's to, what I'll do, damn it. To be fair, um, I didn't fair. I didn't know you were doing that, but um when I worked on the example text for um beyond, uh, I don't know, uh Kent Murder Lake. Hmm. I did kind of a similar thing where it's like I had two characters and then one character would leave that scene and go into the next example scene and then it'd be two characters and then that the second character in that scene with them. So it's kind of like uh, uh, handing the baton between characters through all of the examples. And the same thing, I was like, look at how clever this is. And people were like, yeah, okay. Got the thing. I always love it with like, we, we think we've been incredibly clever because we've amused ourselves. Other people are like, mm hmm. Yeah. The reverse is true. It's like good job. Um, I, I remember most most anecdotally uh, when first edition of Changing the Lost, uh, when uh, Ethan Skemp was working on it, and uh, of course, as we all know, um, everyone loves Changing the Lost. But even when it first came out, people were super excited about it and, and really dug it. And someone posted online how they thought it was amazingly clever of the writers to have each of the courts match one of the stages of grief except for acceptance so that basically all of them are grieving but they never actually come to accept it i don't think we did that on purpose and right if it was like yes that was totally intentional <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh -huh, no. <laughs> it was not intentional it's cool that people notice that <laughs> and it's something i know have come up since in conversation so i think we've leaned into that intentionally later yeah but initially i was just like that was that's cool. I was not a thing we noticed. It's, it's yeah. all just emotions that you have. Right. <laughs> exactly. If anybody has any questions for us, we're putting them in the chat because we get 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And I like uh, answering questions more than I like You may not get a serious answer, but you will get an answer. I mean, I'm, I love bullshitting. 
but you know. Uh, I mean, uh, th this is the last generic panel we've got. I think of the of the convention. We've got plenty of other focused panels. We've got closing ceremony. I don't know oh, that, that's is. true. I, I, I be, be drunk for that. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll be asleep uh, <laughs> and and drunk simultaneously. Yes. <laughs> be drunk oh, at like five thirty. <laughs> it's after five. The Sundays uh, for picking Hopefully. stones and getting hammered. Uh. I will say that much like last year, we thought about doing a, an after party that I will host with Jackbox. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can't host it for any reason, Eddie will probably step in. Mm -hmm. um, but I am looking forward to that. So I'll start talking about that with people. Uh, probably 8, 8.30. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a non-official after party as most conventions have. Like right. most conventions have that thing day up where like most people have gone home, but there are the stragglers. That all get together at a bar, yeah. um, and so yeah, that is that is the the party I plan to host tonight. Uh, so we play some Jackbox. That'll be super fun. So we do have a question in chat, which was, uh, "Have you enjoyed the weekend so far?" Yeah, I, yeah. Honestly, it's 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 kind of funny. Um, just a just a little little story from for for me is that because I do have COVID and my boyfriend does not, I, I, I can't be in the same room with him unmasked, right? Mm -hmm. So we have been, like, switching sections of the apartment all weekend. Mm -hmm. Like, either he's in the study and I'm in the living room mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, and so this, this, this convention has actually kept me feeling connected to humans. Nice. Uh, because I haven't, you know, touched a human being in several days now or gotten a hug or anything or even just, like, sat in a room with one. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has been really nice to like, you know, have faces to look at and people to talk to. Uh, <laughs> I now understand a little more, not completely obviously, but I know some of the folks who were going through the early stages of, of the pandemic by themselves. Uh, I feel like I, I, I get them a little more now because it's only been like four days and it's really isolating to be like, I haven't spent any time with another human being in four, mm -hmm. four days. I can't imagine what folks must have gone through that did this for months and months and months because there were quite a few of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of similar for me because uh, I did plan to attend a physical convention and then uh, there was a, someone in my family got COVID and so out of an abundance of caution, I decided to, to cancel that. Mm -hmm. And the, the convention were very, very cool about it. I mean, there's, there's no drama on that front. Um, but it was also like, oh, man, I was kind of, you know, looking forward to actually doing the convention stuff. And, and this is a different experience. It, it doesn't completely replace it. But like you're saying, it's like it, it is a social lot. And like, oh, I get to run these games and have these conversations that I, I didn't realize how much I was missing until we were in it. Yeah. Um, so it's been really satisfying. It's like, oh, I know what panels are like and sitting on a panel mm -hmm. and watching panels and the kinds of conversations people have uh, during conventions. I am getting all of that from this. So that's, that's very, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, before we answer any more of their questions, I've got a question for the viewers. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first person and to answer listeners. correctly, and the listeners, first person in the live chat right, who answers to... correctly <laughs> wins nothing uh but my respect maybe and so i mentioned uh the vampire the masquerade trivia game in our opening ceremonies i think oh which God, is which, which isn't a product we're working on presently this is a product from about 2006 7 that never got released that i did work on mm -hmm. so my question to you the viewers is and the panelists as well in case either of you two know i was responsible for the malkavian chapter of this game and I have a question for you. According to ancient Malkavian parables, two of his fellow antediluvians were actually Malkav's brothers. For one point, name one of these sibling antediluvians. For three points, name both of these sibling antediluvians. For five whole points, state the parting gesture Malkav performed for one of his brothers before his sibling left on a pilgrimage. This is the reason this game was not released. But <laughs> if you can, <laughs> if anyone here can answer these questions, kudos to you. You will get Matthew points, which are worth something, I'm sure. Uh, in some game somewhere, I will award you an experience point. Obviously, due to uh, currency conversion, one experience counts for a lot more in Story Path and D&D. &D. 
But it really depends what we're playing. And Ian knows the answer, which surprises me. Ian, you're not allowed to answer. (laughs) This offer is void and all Ian. (laughs) See, what's 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 funny for me here is that as as y'all know, I am a person who doesn't read a lot of the lore. I I I tend to just read character creation. So my main character I played in Vampire from the age of like sixteen to like twenty was a Malkavian. Mm. And I had clan book Malkavian and I had Mm -hmm. a bunch of Malkavian lore and I don't remember. (laughs) Or maybe I just never knew. I could tell you where to find this information out if anyone wants to. It's in the Book to. of Nod, right? No, uh, no. It's no. In the uh, this one was sourced from Clan Book Malkavian Revised, according to my information. Which I do uh-huh. own. Oh, actually, uh, yes. Um, although I think some of this may appear also in uh, Thieves in the Night for Vampire the Dark Ages. So we shall see. So far, we have got no accurate answers. I'm very disappointed in all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Ian, that is not permission for you to answer. <laughs> Ian's still blocked. Um, <laughs> I mean, if, if only Ian hadn't gotten fired. <laughs> uh, so, yes, shall, shall we go back to viewer questions? Uh, yes. Um, uh, on the They Came From panel, you mentioned it was the 90s when action films got ridiculous. What do you think of the 1996 film The Rock? I think it's a damn fine classic of action movies that is also a perfect example of how they came from the danger zone can be played. Everyone knows I like um, aquatic themed games. The Rock, of course, does have, uh, there is a maritime setting for it. Um, But also, uh, I think, so I think the, the, the luster was off action movies by the late 80s, early 90s, because well, for the most part, and that that's where you start getting cheap studios pushing uh, straight to video action movies out yeah, mm-hmm. uh, to fill up the bins and blockbuster and wherever else. And so that's where you can really find some gold uh, for Danger Zone, in my opinion. Action movies that are hybrids between... Uh, usually someone with a submachine gun, usually a car blowing up, usually a martial arts movie Mm -hmm. is somewhere in there as well. There will probably be a former Playboy bunny in one of these movies uh, who is no longer modeling but is has now transitioned and into acting right uh, and i use that term loosely so i think all of those things when brought together make a perfect danger zone uh game but you know that's just me i have i have i have one thing to say about the the rock and that is that i uh i listen to a podcast called bechdel cast that is a feminist take on movies and they their episode on The Rock was a pretty early episode of theirs, so go back and listen to it if you want to. Mm-hmm. But one thing that they point out that I had never noticed is that when uh, early in the movie, when he goes to the gravestone of his dead wife, it just says his wife. Is her <laughs> name. So like l- literally, the gravestone is like his wife, and then has her name. Um, and so now on the Bechdel cast for the past several years, if anybody talks about someone's wife who is like otherwise kind of undefined, it's like mm. his wife. Um, and I think that's really funny because I can't imagine like he's not dead. So if anybody else sees that gravestone, they're like, Wh- whose wife? <laughs> whose wife is that? But the viewers know it's, it's his wife. Uh, that must have been a prop department that was told you need to make a gravestone for his, for wife. his wife, like, like yeah. people who design birthday cakes, no, complete with the instruction. Yeah, no, she <laughs> she is named. Her name is Barbara Hummel, but it says his wife, Barbara Hummel. And oh, okay. Um, well, that that is that is still a prop department snafu. Um, I will say that uh, Pilgrim plays. I know who you are. Uh, did throw in set and sawlot, sawlot, if you want, and uh, that is the correct answer. Uh, obviously, I would have accepted Malachi as a uh, separate answer, but that isn't that Malachi doesn't appear in Malkavian parables. Now, no one has answered the five point question, which is what gesture did uh, Malka perform? It wasn't flipping the bird, to damn it, that was my ass. <laughs> As they've departed Enoch. Um, the parting gesture Malka performed for one of his brothers before his siblings left on a pilgrimage. So, you know, uh, we'll up. see. Hey. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, just, hey, <laughs> set. you're not such a bad guy. You're going to get a bad rap in the next 3,000 years. <laughs> I've foreseen it. Finger but... guns. Finger guns. <laughs> 
<laughs> but the you know, it, were invented. Yeah, it's, the, it's that whole snake thing. It's not a good look. <laughs> you know, people are going to confuse you with the bad guy out of Conan. Um, I like that but... Tom Mir has guessed tongue kiss. Like they were just making it. <laughs> <laughs> Malcalf okay, was parables all... do need more making out. That's fair. <laughs> Malcalf was an unpredictable antediluvian. It has to be said. Uh, so yeah, when Set received a tongue kiss from Malcalf, really threw now, him off. Now I'm just imagining that there's um, Malcalf parable fanfic, and I love it. <laughs> There will be now. So that's what the, I've said that, it, so now it exists. That's yeah, that's comment. what the Storyteller's Vault is for. We did just get the correct answer from uh, Bayesian Nash. Uh, he drew the eye on Sawlot's brow. He did. He used his own blood to draw an eyeball, well, an eye, on uh, Sawlot's forehead. I just imagine him using like so a So the Malkavian's basically first. taking all the credit for that. I just uh, imagine but... him using like a Sharpie at first when you said that. <laughs> <Okay. Street, street. laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a googly eye in the middle yeah like while he's sleeping <laughs> he just <laughs> although um uh, they did admit that uh, they went to the bookshelf so <laughs> oh well <laughs> but, uh, that's the you lose all points no yeah. no 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 that no we should encourage our amateur librarians Honestly, I would much rather people look up the rules than just make stuff up and post it online. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, again, I think this is what makes the vampire trivia game somewhat uh, difficult as a prospect. It does require all the players to be sat in a Vampire the Masquerade library <laughs> to play it. Uh, and there aren't that many of them. Uh, it's we're more like, a research game than anything else. Yeah, yeah, it's more the Library of Alexandria. Someone is going around the world burning all of them. Uh, and it's me. You know, I had always heard rumors that if you don't buy the new edition, people come by and burn your old books. And it turns out I was, it was true. I thought it was false all along. Well, I mean, no one can... There's very few vampire books on my shelves anymore. That's because someone got to them. I don't have them anymore. It's, uh, <laughs> they are kaput. I think I've got more werewolf books than vampire these days. That's actually kind of surprising, all things considered. Mm. Someone came and sold them all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're getting close to time. So as always, if people have uh, questions, clearly you're, you're giving a tone of what we're doing here. So um, feel free to ask whatever you like and we'll answer something probably. And we can go over time a little, can't we? Um, that's fair. But uh, one important question that we have not talked about, I think directly to each other, oh. is the fact that there is Super Mario Kart DLC coming out. There I've is. already got it. Oh, have, have you? It. Oh, shit. Is, is it good? Yes, uh, so so far eight of the 16 tracks have been released and uh, it has been wonderful to return uh, to some of the N64 and Wii classics. Oh. Uh, so yes, uh, I very much recommend it. You, If you have got the N64 mod, the thing, that come, virtual console that comes with the right. uh, Switch, you will automatically get the this DLC for Mario Kart, mm. if I oh. recall. Uh, so yeah, it's worth doing regardless because the um, N64 mod gives you access to Mario 64, which is still a fantastic game, uh, mm -hmm. among many others. Mm -hmm. uh, the only sadness is the um, I'm still waiting for Metroid Prime to appear <laughs> in any form on oh, yeah. on the Switch, but so far I have been den denied. Well, then, and I'm assuming that uh, if we play multiplayer everyone has to have the dlc to play the new tracks that's a very good question i don't know how that works yeah no. some sometimes sometimes not in fighting games if one person has the uh dlc everyone yeah, gets okay. access to the same selection panel but anyway mm. yeah anyway well we didn't talk about mario for a while so yeah we can that's street it. fighter it up instead i, I but... think that's fair we actually had talked about doing maybe switching to a different multiplayer game but uh, I, 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 I'm still interested in playing Gang Beast with y'all. I, I need to get it. Yeah, oh, yeah well, we I've, about that. I've got it. Uh, I'm just. I just knock you is that the, is that things. the, as a, as a pushing people off of cliffs game? Right? Yeah, I mean it's wish fulfillment really. But <laughs> I've, um, I got it for in a Nintendo sale for something like three dollars, and then when we, when you looked, it had gone up to something like thirty dollars, and the <laughs> game is fun, but it isn't thirty dollars fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gotta keep an yeah. eye on it. Yeah, wait right. for the tenth anniversary sale. Speaking of which, um, we've got one going on. It's true. Uh, uh, we do have a, a, a sale going on right now. We've been having sales actually every month uh, for Unexpected to celebrate our ten years of being in business, which is great. Uh, this month is a fifty percent off sale for a wide variety of projects or products. We should say. Uh, so obviously, 
you can find those at Director RPG. But also, I do want to emphasize, if you're looking for special editions or physical books, um, definitely check out Studio 2 and Indie Press Revolution, uh, because they also have things like dice and screens, things that we don't necessarily have on Director RPG, but also um, you can get different ac access to the, the physical books, and it helps us to clean our inventory out, which is a big part of it. But also, for those deluxe editions, the only way you can get access to some of those, and once they're gone, they're gone. We're not going to be remaking those. So, if there's a, if you're looking at that really nice exalted third edition exalted or uh, deluxe book, now's the time to maybe snap it up. Yeah, it's a good time to do it. I'll always have lots. Um, Michaela asks, which Mario Kart track you hate running the most? It's Rainbow Road. Yeah, why oh, I know, I know Dixie's answer. It's the Excite Bike Arena or I do fucking the hate. or the baby. No, I, I fucking hate the Excite Bike Arena. I love Excite Bike Arena. Well, I love <laughs> amazing. all those weird We're racing jump, ones that nobody else seems to like, so it's okay. I like the new ones. Uh, the only ones I dislike, and I don't think I could name one in particular, uh, are the water-based ones. Uh, bizarrely for me, I know. I'm shocked. Um, but yeah, I find, and I know it's purely in my mind's eye that there is actually no difference to the speed at which you travel on water themed stages, um, unless you go off the track. Are you sure? It, yeah, yeah. Well, because if you enter water and you're on the track, you and everyone else are traveling at the same speed. Right. You know, no one is moving any faster oh, or slower you. than usual. Right. Um, but for me, it suddenly feels like it's slower. And for some reason, that, that bothers me. Um, I think, yeah, that. What's the one on the Toad Cup? It's the second track. Um, I, I think it's remember. specifically for the Switch. Um, but yeah, it's one of the water ones. It's probably Blue, Blue Yoshi World or some. Oh, monster. okay. I, think I'm talking I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. We've been asked who we all main on Mario Kart. Uh, I generally play Donkey Kong these days. Um, I. I initially i didn't i was like i just picked stuff that looked cool but then early on i think it was dixie shared the the, the breakdown that, that her boyfriend found of all the different kind of tracks and wheels and how they all sync up um and donkey kong has a nice weight distribution that feels good for my controls so mm -hmm. i usually do donkey kong on a motorcycle i find this is what i like to do yeah what about you matthew uh, I like the mid-weight uh, Koopalings, typically. I'll go for Larry or Iggy. Um, th those tend to be my preferred ones. Um, I mean, I, I don't think there's much of any difference between Larry, Iggy, Luigi, Mario. Yo um, Yoshi might be a light one. But I do prefer Koopalings just because I like playing bad guys. They're more colorful. That's true. Uh, and I, I tend to play either Rosalina or Daisy uh, because I like playing girls. So I was like, when I was playing the original Mario Kart, I was always Peach. Um, and then with some of the other ones, like Double Dash and stuff, I played Daisy, I played Toadette, I played all the like, you know, they, they've been giving you more girl characters as time goes on, which is nice because I don't want to yeah. just play Peach. Uh, mm -hmm. And I occasionally will play the girl from Splatoon because she's cool. Uh, yes. But... But but overall, I do Rosalina on a motorcycle usually. Uh, Michaela has said that we don't main Yoshi or Boost, so we're no longer friends. So oh, well, anyways, fair enough. It was nice being friends with you. I'm sorry. But, yeah, we'll you know. terminate any contracts you've got outstanding. For. <laughs> <laughs> you can go with Ian into the shame hole. <laughs> <laughs> but see, just... it's like we made them when you wouldn't made them, and so now you can play with us, Michaela. Right. See. Like, yeah. As Yoshi or Boo. Exactly. Wouldn't hmm. you rather play with us? <laughs> we had a good run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, we are getting towards time. So you want to you want to do the do the pathcast wrap up? Yes, we do. We should do the pathcast wrap up. So, um... or oh, 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 shall we allow three more questions? <laughs> I have a panel more. directly after this. Right. So Dixie has yeah, to go. Yeah. Dixie's yeah. running tax, so let, we let, have to go. We'll be responsible. We will be responsible. Fair enough. Um, uh, but I mean, this was fun. I think maybe we can do some more stuff with just three of us hanging out again as as the year goes on. Um, like, for example, I mentioned in opening ceremonies that there was a game show idea I had for this con that just didn't quite pan out. So I think we're going to possibly do um, the game show for the Pathcast. So that's something else we will definitely uh, look into possibly doing. But in the meantime, if people wanted to talk to you about who you main on Mario Kart, where would they find you online, Dixie? Yeah, you find me everywhere at Dixie Cyanide. It's under, under me right now. It's right there. Um, and that's also me on Discord and in Twitch chat and everywhere else. So easy to find. And you, Matthew? 
Uh, they can find me on Twitter at DawkinsMP. They can find me on MatthewDawkins.com, where they can also find a link to all of the books I've worked on, including the vast number of Onyx Path books. Do buy them if you want from there, and I'll get a cut. But most importantly, look for us on the Onyx Path Discord, because we're all there, and we are generally happy to interact with you. Yeah. Um, and you can find me at uh, Pugsteady on Twitter. That's P-U-G-S-T-A-D-Y. You can find my website at Pugsteady.com. You can find me on the Onyx Path Discord, probably answering a lot of questions about the stuff we talked about during this weekend. And before I go, if you have some time today, you've seen all the panels you want to see and you got to have some freeze time, go check out startplaying.games. Mm -hmm. um, we are still running some games this weekend. And uh, they are pay per ticket, but um, half the money goes to your game master and the rest go to either start playing games. 40% of the money does go to our charity, the Madonna Group. They are a fantastic organization. We cannot say enough about them. So please support them. And if you can't play a game, consider donating directly to the Madonna Group. Mm -hmm. They are wonderful people. So all that said, I hope you enjoy the rest of your convention. If you're hearing this in the future, I hope you enjoyed listening to this little slice of Onyx Path Con. And as always, many worlds. One Pathcast.